So hopefully the slightly clickbait title of this video has got plenty of Harris Hawkers um, intrigued. Maybe some of you are starting to see already just at the title. Let's get a couple of things clear first. First off, because I did have someone on social media actually sort of make a comment that really, you know, I've got an eagle and I'm sort of down on hawk, falconers that fly hawks and things. How, I nearly saw then, how utterly ludicrous is that? Two of the best falconers I know fly hawks, Harris hawks and red tails. Uh, one's my son and one's his mate. So I'm certainly not down on people flying hawks. I love flying hawks, goshawks, red tails, Harris hawks. <sighs> Eagles are hard work and time consuming things, even more so than any other sort of falcon bird that people think of like the Harris hawk, or I can fly it at weekends and things. I want you guys to get the very best from your birds. So when you see any of my videos, they're proactive, they're not negative or down on species of birds or types of falconers and the birds they choose to fly. So on that note, I urge you to take a look at this magazine, uh, The World of Falconry, because the latest copy has my latest um, article in there, which is all about Harris Hawks. And I'd like to think if you read that article and I think it's my favourite article I've written for that magazine, to be quite honest. Um, if you read the article, I think you'll see that I'm passionate about Harris Hawks and passionate about people flying them well. And now, if you're a, a dabbler uh, and you don't like my videos because they make you feel like you're not doing a good job, rightly so, because if you're a dabbler, you're not a true falconer. Link in the description below. Take out a subscription because it is a really good magazine full of interesting articles. So what do I want when I put a clickbaity type title on a thumbnail for one of these videos that I know is going to get some people sort of hackles up just reading it? Well, I want you to watch the video because I really want you to aspire to be really, really good falconers. Now, not good like there's some kind of competition, simply good that you're getting the very best from your own falconry and the very best from your birds because that way you're really, really gonna be a falconer for many, many years to come. Practicing falconry well is incredibly time consuming and it's not an easy thing to do. And that's why dabblers take it on. They become falconers, inverted commas, for a very brief time. And then they get rid of the bird that they've got. What a shame, what a shame, because they needn't have bothered in the first place. All the things I've ever done that I've enjoyed, I've strived to do them to the best of my ability. Now, I'm not competitive with other people, but I'm massively competitive with myself. I always want to do the best I can in anything I enjoy. You can get to a, a plateau in anything, full career, anything, and, and be happy. But why be happy there? Because you'll get far more from your chosen passion and pastime if you strive to do it as best as you possibly can. Hold on a second. Someone up there, somewhere, somewhere up there, someone's having more fun. Noisy swine. I'll give you an example. For a decade of my life, I was massively into fast motorbikes. Now I rode on track days, but most of the time, and I was lucky because I worked shifts at the time, I could get out on my bike and do hundreds of miles a week. Now I wasn't just bumbling around. Uh, nowadays it seems ludicrous, just sort of a, a decade or two later, because of the, the way the roads are so crowded, and also everyone's out, all, even Sundays the roads are busy, and everyone's got a dash cam, so I couldn't have a bike anymore. I would go out with my mates, and we would race on the road. And you know, we would race on the road, we'd ride knee down around all the roundabouts and bends on the country lanes, and we'd pull wheelies, first, second, third, fourth gear on the back wheel, well over 120 miles an hour on the back wheel. Sounds absolutely ludicrous saying it out loud. I think the fastest I've ever been on a bike on the clock, it was probably lying because speedos overrate themselves, was just under, it was 179, just touching 180 miles an hour. Um, allegedly, I went past a speed camera van once at 155 miles an hour and I sat up to brake and then thought, what's the point? And just carried on. He hadn't got a chance, had he? Allegedly. So, crazy stuff. Now, when I was out with my mates, we were racing on the roads. And of course I was competing with them because I was racing them. We were literally racing each other. And that was still me competing with myself, honing my own skills. I'm just not that sort of person. I love going out with falconers that are way better than me because I still like to learn stuff. And that's the essence of falconry. 
So that's what I want you to hope to be, is a better falconer all the time. So let's look at the title of this video and what it's all about. But first, let me just see if I can get Zara to come out of her resting aviary because she's been in there now for a few months of winter. She had a very short hunting season at the beginning of the year. And then Kyle flew my golden eagle, if you remember, and I was gonna fly Zara and I just haven't had time because we've had so much to do this winter at the Falkery Center, mostly setting up the British mammal area, oddly enough. I'll see if I can get her out. Hold that space. So there she is. She's had a few months now chilling out and molting. And people often think, you know, when will my bird molt and can I molt them at this time? They'll molt at any time of the year working birds. Usually when I have a rest and their weight goes up as well. So they, they're generally, their hormones are triggered by really the day length increasing through spring and summer. In the wild, that's when the going gets good again. There's more food available, more calories to grow more feathers. But if you work your birds and you rest them at another time of year, very often they'll start molting well. So she's been molting for the last sort of couple of months now. Bearing in mind it's the end of March right now. Short, very short fulcrum season at the beginning of winter. And now rested, molted. And she's got to fly now all summer for me as a display bird, um, doing some mock fulcrum chases and things for audiences. Um, first time she's had a hood on for a while we'll leave that on for a second and you can see she's sulking people sometimes think it's because the hood's too heavy when a bird does this and when it's newly hooded um, it's not at all it's just their senses are so disorientated they kind of droop their head down and look pretty miserable let's see what she does oh there we go by the way just coat the end of a beak really briefly as well um, not a full coat, just literally took the end off. The beak grows uh, often quite fast during the molt because the hormones that trigger those feather, that feather growth also often triggers the beaks to grow even faster. We'll leave her there. Excuse me, I have got man flu. Um, yes, it's probably the new variety of man flu that's going around. Getting over it now. If my nose is bright red or I have to have a, a break to de-snot my nose, I do apologise, but excuse me. <coughs> this is what it's like at the moment. So let's go back to the start of this video. Don't fly your Harris Hawks in groups. Why not? Now I know some of you are thinking, pitchforks at the ready. Why not? Two reasons why not. One is health and safety of birds. The other is you and your birds being absolute shadows of falconers and falconry birds that you could be. So let me just start by chilling out and relaxing some of you in the audience now. If you go out with your mates at a weekend, uh, each brandishing a Harris Hawk through the woods, maybe five, six, eight Harris Hawks at a time, and you're all stomping along through the woods and you're seeing the odd chase and the birds are flying together and you're happy doing that and you feel fulfilled as a falconer doing that, and you keep your birds in a inverted commas happy and healthy way well good luck to you and if you enjoy that that's perfectly fine by me and you certainly don't need my permission do you that's what you enjoy and that's what you aspire to that's great but there's a couple of reasons not to i obviously because i've got a youtube channel i guess and i'm probably because i'm old people ring me people message me people email me about various things to do with falconry something i get year on year a, a, a sort of a question, chill out girl, uh, three times so far this, this last season. Dave, have you ever had a female Harris Hawk flying in a group, fly off and attack and kill someone else's Harris Hawk? No, I haven't, but I know plenty of people I had. So bear in mind, three just in this winter alone. Generally, it's a female Harris Hawk, generally, often in her first season, with no social etiquette really, and generally she'll attack and more than likely kill a male Harris Hawk because he's smaller, he's an easy target in the group. Harris Hawks do not just fly happily with other Harris Hawks, and if you actually think about animal behavior, it'd be pretty obvious, wouldn't it? If they're not socialized together and they don't get on in the first place, and they're at a tight hunting weight, and many, Novice falconers, I'm going to say, will often fly their birds hungrier than they need to be. We're on an airspace here. My goodness, what have we got now? Helicopter. You've got a first year female Harris Hawk, so it's bigger than the males in the group. You've got a bird that's overly hungry, 
you've got a bird that has no social etiquette and doesn't even know these other birds. Hold on a second, let him go by. And that bird hasn't even met the other Harris Hawks that your mates have got flying in this sort of, this group gang that's going on. Think about it. Do you fly, do Harris Hawks hunt in a pack in the deserts of America? Or do they fly around in a flock? Because a group of birds is a flock, isn't it? But let's face it, these are predators. They're hunting in a loose pack. Starlings flock. If you see a murmuration of maybe a thousand starlings flying in the sky in the evening, getting ready to maybe sleep down in a reed bed somewhere, they're checking out the area, and another 50 starlings joins that huge murmuration, the other thousand they go, oi, get out of our airspace, clear off you strangers, you yellow-beaked swines, go away. No, they don't do that, because they're a bird that flocks for safety in numbers, they just all join together. Harris hawks aren't doing that, they're working in a pack. Think about the pack animals that you kind of know, humans that go hunting in a pack of humans, um, let's say wolves, let's say, I don't know, lions maybe. What do humans do when they meet another tribe? They try and kill them and take all their stuff. What do wolves do when they meet another pack? Sometimes they get on, very often they'll fight. What do lions do, pride of lions? Very often they'll fight. In fact, young male lions, younger up and coming, will often try and outdo the older male lions in another pride or pack and kill them and take over those girls for themselves. So pack animals very often, in fact, probably generally, are territorial because they're hunting in a pack as an evolutionary way of getting more food for themselves and they don't want another pack taking that food in their area. So pack animals don't just get on with other pack animals because they work in a group. It's totally stupid when you think about it, isn't it? So you've got your Harris's hawk. Now, your mates have got five Harris's hawks, they're all out, they've got one each, and they go out the weekend, and you get a Harris hawk, nice young female. They've muckled through, theirs have all survived, and most of them are males anyway. You take your female, you've got it trained, it's obedient, you've caught a couple of things, and your mates say, come on, or you say, come on, come out with you guys, it looks like fun. The other guys, birds are working through the trees. I'd like to say you unhood your female, but I bet you didn't even do that bit, but <laughs> sorry to say. But you've let your female off. Now, you've trained her to hunt. You've maybe dragged a rabbit. She's caught a rabbit carcass. A live rabbit, maybe, or a rabbit carcass. You've maybe got hold of a, a pheasant carcass and you've, you've swung that or dragged that and she's chased that. So she's orientated to things with feathers and fur. And off she goes. You let her free. First thing she sees is one of the male Harris horses just bumbling around in a peripheral vision. Target. Locked on. Beeline. She's not thinking. All she's thinking is, kill it. It's another creature. Food. I'll eat it plows into that bird it's not territorial this thing's only in its first year it's got no territorial instincts just thinking prey just triggered by the movement by the time it's got hold of it it's not even thinking it's another harris hawk it's just going in that motion of killing it and the thing's moving and it's it's programmed to kill three times just this winter just the people that know me have asked me that because it's happened to them if you are flying harris hawks in a group they need to be socialised and they also need to get on. Just like some people get on and will work well together, other people won't get on. They won't work well together. They'll try and kill each other because they're different and so on and so forth. So number one reason not to fly your Harris Hawks in a group is because it can end in death and Harris Hawks aren't just group animals that all see each other as best mates to go hunting. That's probably the most serious reason not to fly them in a group. But the most important reason, in many ways to my eyes, is quite simple. If you fly your Harris Hawk as your main flying in a group with other people's Harris Hawks, unless it's exceptional, the one in the group that is, you're going to always have the most mediocre falconry and fly the most mediocre falconry bird. I've been out with people that do this regularly, and I can tell you now, I think, oh, blimey, that's their weekend's falcon, is it? Ooh, I don't know. I'd aspire to more. Maybe it's good fun once or twice. I don't know. But this is what happens. This is what I see as an outsider looking in. Possibly an older, experienced bird that was flown on its own for quite some time, leading the chase. It's switched on. It's hunting properly. It's hunting properly for itself. It works really hard and it eventually makes a kill. Even though it's balked by all these other harassers just basically getting in the way, making the quarry turn in the wrong direction. It makes a kill. And then all the other hawks, or most of them, plough in. And the amount of people that actually say, 
This is why you should have a swivel and a leash on. There's an amount of people that actually say, yeah, mine caught one today. No, it didn't. The other bird caught it. You can't say yours caught a rabbit because it joined in after someone else had done the catching. And they're happy with that. And they'll not shut up as my hawk caught one. It's absolutely ridiculous because those other birds have learned, if they go out in this group regularly, that Frida over there, she's good. I'll just keep following her. When she's catching something, I'll try and rob a bit of that food. They're no different in that respect than humans, are they? If you work in an office environment or maybe a factory environment, and it depends on teamwork. So I'll give you an example. I spent 14 years as a print finisher. I ran a big machine, the various machines, but the big machine, a muller, that put magazines together from folded sheets of printed paper. And I relied on two, three, four, five, even six assistants on this huge machine to help me run this machine. When I was given my crew, I didn't pick it, because obviously you'd pick your favourite people, wouldn't you, that you know worked hard. The manager picked your crew every day. And when I got my crew, I thought, oh, not him or her lazy bustards and i knew i'd have to work harder because i'd got a lazy person on my crew that would do more effort to do no work than they would actually put effort in to work and because i'm take pride in what i do and i always try and be the best at what i do on the day or do as best as i can possibly do i'd work harder to make sure i still churned out as much work as i would with a top crew on board if you like so i'd work harder to fill in for the fact I'd got someone lazy on the crew. And to be honest, so would the other good crew members on my machine. They'd step up their game because they know they've got someone lazy that's not pulling their weight. These birds will do the same. The lazy ones will let the other ones do the work and they'll still get the reward at the end of it. The people still got paid, the bird still gets its food. If that's your hawk, it's never gonna get any better than that. Absolute rubbish. It's just mediocre. Fly your Harris hawk on its own. Harris hawks in South America, they work on their own. They're not in a hard to, hard to work in desert by day. They're on the edge of a rainforest, pampas. They work on their own, there's plenty of food. They do very, very well indeed. Fly your Harris hawk on its own. Get it to the best it can be, the best you can be. Socialize it with other Harris hawks. If you tether your bird out, tether it next to your mate's Harris hawks if you can. Closer, so they can't touch, but close enough that it can develop that social sort of side of things. And if you want to a later date, now and again fly with your mates, brilliant, but your bird's still top notch, even if it's not as good that day because of all the other birds getting in its way. If you want to be a really good falconer and you want to fly an exceptional Harris's hawk, first off, fly that bird alone until it's really, really good at its game before you think about flying it as, as a mainstay in a group with your friends for sure. Like I say, Please read a copy of that magazine, read that article. You'll know I'm passionate about you flying Harris's Hawks. You'll know I'm passionate about Harris's Hawks and the potential they can reach. And you'll get a good insight into the potential, the, the I'm gonna be generous, the top 5% UK Harris Hawks can reach. These birds are probably the best bird in falconry. If you took everything together, I fly Golden Eagle. If I wanted to live off the land, I wanted to relax a bit more. I'd fly one of these for sure. Brilliant birds, but the way the UK falconry is, we are not seeing the potential of hardly any Harris's hogs. If you've got one, you can turn this into an absolute machine that is an absolute hunting partner and a joy to be around. But you've got to put the time in. Try and grow your falconry. Try and excel. At, at, you know, be the best you can be. Don't worry about what everyone else is doing. But be the best you can be. Look at what other people are doing. Learn from the good stuff. Realise that some of the stuff, I don't want to be doing that. So, am I saying now, don't fly Harris's Hawks in a group. It's rubbish. No. No, you're not listening. <laughs> Harris's Hawks will hunt in a group in the wild. Working more than one Harris Hawk together gives you a fascinating, fascinating insight into their team skills. But so does working with your ferrets and your dog and your Harris Hawk and yourself, because you've still built yourself a team. Your hawk still understands or learns what its place is in that team. If you really want to fly a Harris Hawk in a group, get your Harris Hawk to be absolute top notch. Keep it socialized if possible. And then if your friend, or maybe there's two of you that are really into this thing, fly them as a cast two really good Harris Hawks that are well socialised. 
you get a glimpse then. They're in that team with you, your ferrets, your dog maybe. They hate dogs, but they understand the dog's purpose. You will see a different side to those Harris Hawks, for sure if you're flying more than one at once. It's quite possible to fly a cast of Harris Hawks on your own if you have the game and we are talking a lot of game for any fulcrum bird, way more than most people realise. You need so much game, uh, not necessarily so much land, but you need a lot of game, and often that means we need a lot of land to fly over to find the game. I've quite successfully and really enjoyed the thrill of flying Zara, her boyfriend Nigel, working a box of ferrets over my shoulder with or without a dog. Often, the dog, unless it's obedient, can complicate matters. Ferret's pretty good. Learn to hood your falconry birds because it's so easy. You've got the female hooded on the glove, you've got the male hooded on the glove, you've got two birds you can now carry to wherever you want to go hunting on the glove. One person, one glove, two hawks not baiting around because they're hooded. Don't bait now. Ferret's over your shoulder. You can leash one of your birds to a fence hooded while you're ready the other one get its flying equipment on, cast it up into a tree maybe, and then pick the other bird up, ready that, unhood her, cast her up into the tree. You've got the ferrets, the birds are working free, they're socialized with your ferrets, so they're not gonna try and eat your ferrets, you can trust them implicitly once they know what ferrets are for. You can be working the ferrets, you are now, you and the ferrets are the team serving a cast of Harris Hawks working through the tree line. Of course, walking a woodland, who knows what you're gonna put up, but you've achieved this yourself. You're not going out with a rabble of Harris Hawks that are all mediocre. You've now achieved two fantastic falconry birds working in a coherent team as falconry birds with you, the falconer, and your ferrets and dog. There's nothing wrong with flying Harris Hawks together. My goodness, if you've got the time and the energy and the skills to put into it, blisteringly exciting and something different to you know, anything else we can do in falconry, really. Take away from this video, that I want you to make the best hawk possible and I want you to be the best falconer possible and still massively enjoy your falconry. And in 20 years time, be doing it even better than you are now. Not in two months time, putting on an advert somewhere, Harris Hawk for sale, new job forces sale. The usual line. Please subscribe to the channel. It is a massive boost to us. More falconry videos coming, thanks a lot. And one more thing, if you are subscribed and you do watch the vlogs, this is not the falconry video I wanted to put out this week. There's, a, I think, a more pressing, uh, urgent video that we all need to be aware of in falconry, all of us falconers as a whole in the UK. I just haven't had time, but I'll get to that this week. Stop it. I'm going to unhood her, give her a first bit of food on the gloves she's had for a little while now. And in the next couple of days, she'll be back up in the air, flying free. And what a wonderful bird, isn't it? A bird that you can take from an aviary by just reducing its weight down until it'll hop to you. And then a couple of days later, whack a transmitter on, no crins line needed, just fly it free. Might be a little bit slow, might be a little bit nervous. The Harris's hawk. What a wonderful species it is.